Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody warm? Mm -hmm. Especially with the way the weather is outside. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's a beautiful day. The sun is out. The sun is here. Oh, welcome to, to church this morning. For those of you online, welcome. Uh, if you are here online, please shout out in the comments there. Let us know that you're here. Um, just some announcements before we get started. We are almost done with January. I'm not really sure how that happened. I mean, yesterday was a solemn day for me in, in a way, because I remember walking through the Pomida in Knoxville, Iowa, and stopping in the Electronic Center, just as the Challenger lifted off. Mm -hmm. I sat there, stood there in horror with several other folks as it exploded. Yes. Uh, saw a video last night of the backup teacher watching from a distance and just the emotion that, that shot through her. But as I watched that and, and I thought about that, all I could think of was God is still in control and God is good. Yeah. And so that just takes us right back to our favorite saying that's on the, well, it's not quite on the wall, it's leaned against the wall right now, but this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So with February coming, we have a lot of things starting to happen. Our next men's breakfast will be at nine o'clock next Saturday morning. Um, I don't know, I think Mark was hinting about something being on the menu here. A little white stuff on top of some golden brown pucks of some sort. And he's like, damn, yeah, biscuits are gravy. So uh, we'll be doing that next Saturday at nine. Um, then the following Saturday, it's hard to believe it was already here. It was just like yesterday, it was like 74 days before the next race, and now we're two weeks out. So we'll be starting season 18 on the 11th uh, with uh, registration at 9.30 and racing at 10. No rules changes for the racers, with one exception to that. There's a car that's called the Sidekick. It's called that because the side, little piece on the side kicks out of it. That has been moved to our Outlaw class because it's just too fast for the class that was being raced in. So anything that dominates more than three months in a year, it gets moved off just for the sake of competition. So we're like NASCAR in the fact that we do change the rules, but we don't do a mid-season like NASCAR does. So we try to make it easier for everybody to know what's going on. And then April 1st, yes, it is. April Fool's Day, but there's nothing foolish about what we're going to be doing that day. We, the men are going to be traveling to Davenport uh, to go to Iron, Sherpin's Iron. Uh, we'll be listening to several uh, breakout sessions, but the main sessions will be led by uh, Joe Martin and Stephen Kendrick. And for more about that, there's a sheet on the back. For those of you watching online, there's a link that's going to be put up in the comments. It takes you right to the page on our website that talks more about it and since you're watching online and you can't sign this here there's a sign up form for you so go ahead and fill that out um, I'll just pass this around see if there's anybody that needs to put their name on there and uh, we're looking forward to that and also uh, Last thing that's going to be popping up in there before we get started with our actual worship service is going to be today's playlist of the uh, worship music that we'll be singing after the online portion of the service. So with that, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we just thank you. You have given us the sun outside that even though we have had some bitterly cold weather, we've had some snow, you remind us that each day is new, that you have created it for us. You, have give, you are giving us an opportunity to come before you in worship, Father. Father, as we begin uh, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the message that Mark has prepared, the words that you have given him to answer the question, are you a regifter? Father, we just ask that we would hear what you have for us, knowing that each of us may walk away with a completely different message depending on where we're at in our walk and where we're at with you, Father but that you will teach us through this message. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from 
the uh, CEV version of the Bible. It's from John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, where it says this, But a time is coming, and it is already here. Even now, the true worshipers are being led by the Spirit to worship the Father according to the truth. These are the ones the Father is seeking to worship Him. God is Spirit, and those who worship God must be led by the Spirit to worship Him according to to the truth. Now, at this point in time, it's a time coming when divisions would cease. The divisions between the Samaritans and the Jews and the Gentiles and the Jews. And that carries forward today to today. There's some 38,000 plus denominations, Christian denominations in the world today. We are divided and it just breaks my heart. When I was a youth pastor in with a denominational church, there were some there that uh, we had a, we were in agreement on doctrine, and we there were some that there were some doctrinal things that we didn't agree on. But the thing we could all agree on was that Jesus was the Son of God. He came us to save us from our sins, and so we agreed to focus on that bringing unity instead of division. And people see that unity instead of division. And that's going to change the way people think about Christians. True worship is a contrast uh, with what we think it is. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Worship isn't just about singing songs or going to church on Sunday. There are certain aspects of it that do incorporate that, but Worship is about being in line with the Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to move through us and to teach through us, continuing the work that was begun by Jesus. And I think I'm going to end this before we bring up Pastor Mark to really teach us what the message is today. Is that The most important part of worship is our attitude as worshipers. So as we come in and we listen to, to the message that God has given to Mark about asking us the question, are we a re-gifter? I can't go any further than that before I would start probably cutting too much into this sermon this morning. So, Father God, we bring Mark up here right now, Father. We bring him up here with a, health, a healthy body, Father. You've, you've transformed him. You've used the doctors that you gave the expertise to and, and the people that came up with the medicines to bring healing to his lungs so that he can now breathe again, Father. Father, you have given him a spirit that is able to teach. It's his, one of his gifts. And Father, as he comes up here to teach us more about what that is and what that means for each of us, Father, we just thank you that he heard your message and that he is going to bring it to us this morning in a way that is powerful, a way that teaches, in a way that can draw us and leave, help us to leave this place and use those words. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. amen. I'll give you the $20 after the service. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Pastor Terry. Uh, for those of you who are here Wednesday night, I had a pretty bad episode with my asthmatic bronchitis and I really truly couldn't breathe. It was it was pretty scary. Oh. Pretty scary. They were offering to take me to the hospital and oh and uh, I'm here and I'm able to breathe today, yeah. which is awesome. Awesome. Yeah. But and that's about me. As I was kind of contemplating this, I was listening to Pastor Terry's message last week and and i was thinking about worship and he was talking about um you know we worship as we wait and i thought about okay so how do we worship and what is worship and and kind of some of the aspects in there and then uh as i was laying there awake at 3 30 in the morning and god's just pouring stuff into my head and one of the things was you know are we doing what god wants us to do with the blessings and gifts which are acts of worship for us from god 
Are we re-gifting those acts of worship out to others? Are we giving those gifts away? And so today's message is, are you a re-gifter? Are you a re-gifter? So in last week's message, Patrick Terry mentioned that we worship while we wait, and so it got me to thinking, you know, what is worship? And it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And worship takes on many, many, many different forms as we go through. But basically, it's listening to God, talking to God, and God responding to us. In its basic form, worship is a response. And for those who know and love Jesus, worship is the response of our entire lives for what God is doing through Christ in our lives. So worship can, can be both a war cry in the midst of an unseen battle. And we were talking about spiritual battles going on and what that's like. And if you want to know more, Ephesians 6.12 talks about that. And it's also the chorus of our souls. And I love that because you go through the Psalms and it always just puts it into kind of really neat words. But this actually came from Isaiah. It is the chorus of our souls in the response to our creator. Isaiah 43, 21. So the question says then or becomes, it's a response to what? We're responding to something, but what is it? Well, if we think about it, our worship is our response to the gifts that God gives us through Jesus. We all know the big ones out there. You know, if you've been around church or hang around church any time for your lives, you got eternal life. It's a big gift. It's a pretty big one. Kind of hard to beat that one. Gifts of the Spirit, salvation, grace, mercy, eternal love. And that list can go on and on and on because God's gifts are eternal. There's no end to the blessings. There's no end to the gifts that God gives us. And so therefore, the list is infinite. It goes on eternally. And see, that's what makes worship so amazing. It's both something we participate in because of who God is, and it's also what we do because God created us to worship. Have you ever thought about it that way? So it's something that we do today. We're here gathered in worship to God to learn more about God, to commune with God. And at the same time, it's what we do because God created us to worship him. So when we think about that, God's people and the worship that we bring has been uniquely designed for us by God. And I want you to hang on to that thought as we go through the message today. So we just came out of the holiday season, right? And with Christianity aside, we're going to put Christianity aside, Christmas has been synonymous with presents, right? Sometimes we use the word gifts, but see, I really see a marked difference between the word presents and gifts. Because present is something that is given, but it's usually tied to something like a, a birthday present or a Christmas present or a special date or an anniversary present. Um, so it's usually tied to a special date or a circumstance or something. But when it comes to Christmas presents, there's usually an expectation of receiving as well. <coughs> now remember, I said Christianity aside. So, you know, the better to give than receive hasn't kind of caught on into the um, mainstream out here. But in the secular world, we're expected to give something back when we receive a present. And so it's it's kind of being tied together. And so there, there comes with it a, an implied response that you have to do something. You have an obligation to fulfill in receiving a present. Whereas if you're receiving a gift, a gift is usually something that has been freely given. No ties whatsoever, no strings, no expectations are expected, none are attached to it. And see, that's what God's agape love is. A love that is given by God with no strings attached whatsoever. He gives us that love because we are his children. 
no strings attached. So who here has ever received a gift? Yeah? Everyone, huh? Oh, no hands go up. Okay. Who here has ever re-gifted a gift? Now be honest. Okay, Terry. Oh, yeah. Diane. Oh, ha, ha, see. We got re-gifters in the crowd. Not such a bad thing. However, in society today, it's kind of frowned upon, you know. Yeah, it's not real classy. It's not kind of cool. Uh, some people even say it's a really low thing to do. Maybe even thoughtless. Well, anyway, you get the idea. Regifting in the secular world doesn't seem to be a really, uh, you know, highly thought upon thing. But regifting can be an absolutely great thing. And because that's exactly what God calls us to do. He calls us to re-gift his gifts. He calls us to re-gift his blessings. And see, that in itself is an act of worship. As we are re-gifting what God has given us, we are blessing someone else. That's exactly what God wants us to do. He wants us to be a blessing to others. And in the process, we get doubly blessed. We got the blessing from God, and now we get to give it away, and we get blessed for giving it away. That's a great thing. Regifting is really cool. I'm here to tell you. So, regifting is something that I would encourage you today to regift as often as possible. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and that's kind of when we think about gifts from God, we think about those kind of things. So, in the background back in here, there's there's you did that. I was going, wow. I didn't think it was a touch screen. Then I knew it wasn't a touch screen. Okay. So, <laughs> woo, that was kind of fun. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. So in the background in here, I've got little pictures of gifts and, and the gifts of the Spirit on the other side. And it gives us a listing of nine gifts that we can receive when we come into a relationship with God. Now, these are special gifts, and these are gifts of the Spirit that comes in and indwells within us. But there's other gifts as well, and we're going to cover those today in my message, but I bet they're gifts that you probably have never thought of. So 1 Corinthians 12, concerning the spiritual gifts. Now about the gifts of the spirits, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. This almost sounds like a tent revival type thing he was doing at that point in time. Kind of fun. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Idols that had no effect on your lives whatsoever. They were just objects. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kind of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. We're supposed to use these gifts in community with each other. To one, there's given through the Spirit, a message of wisdom to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by that same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between the Spirits. To another, speaking in different types of tongues. And still, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. And see, all of these gifts that Paul is talking about here, these nine separate gifts that are given out by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, as you come in to communion with God, as you join together in Spirit. When we join together in Spirit, it's called... Worship. Worship. As we worship God, 
and we bring the Holy Spirit in, all of these gifts that are given to us are to help us worship. Now I'm going to switch gears, completely switch gears on you in a minute, and I want you to think about all of the trials and the challenges and the stuff you got going on in life. Ever think about those things as gifts? Not much, huh? Not lately. Mm -mm. But did you know that many of the trials and challenges in our lives are to prepare us to be a gift to others later on in life? How about that? Kind of turned the tables on it a bit, didn't it? And I know it seems kind of counterintuitive, but it's true. I know because it's happened to me a number of times. The stuff I went through early on in my life, I've actually used to help other people out later on because I've got that same experience. It's a lot easier when you're going through stuff if you have somebody that can relate to that and help you through it. You ever think that God put that person in your life for that exact purpose at that exact time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, happens all the time. We were talking to a couple on Friday night and that's exactly what he was he doesn't believe in God because he's mad at God. Because God took his mom away from him and his mom was his life. And she had horrible uh, experience with health issues and things like that. And he said, there can't be a good God out there because he wouldn't allow this to happen. And so he's mad. He goes, I, I'm not even sure there is a God. And then he brought this young lady into his life. He went through a horrible divorce. He was living in a camper. He was melting snow for water. And he went through this for two years. And God brought somebody into his life. Now she tells him that God brought her into his life. He says, the somebody brought, it, brought her into his life. But it totally changed his life. And I says, why can't that be God? Why can't God have brought you her into your life to change and you've changed your life for the better right your life is better now well yeah it's immeasurably better i said that's what god does as a matter of fact they they actually said they may want to come and visit church here which he hasn't done hasn't done yet yet <laughs> yet so being that blessing for someone else when they're going through a particularly hard time in their life, when they're going through something that you can't see, you can't see the way out of the pit that you're in. You're in the bottom of that pit, the lowest of low. And then God brings somebody or something into your life to come and stand alongside you, to be a blessing to you. And in the process, it blesses their life as well. See, that's regifting that blessing. That God gave because you got brought through a trial in your life. He didn't leave you there. He didn't leave you at the bottom of the pit. He brought you through that trial. And now he's using you to bring somebody else through their trial. That's free gifting. That's what it's about. So it's probably happened to all of us in some way in our life. And that's what God wants to do. Be a re-gift, a blessing that has been given and received by us and give it so that someone else can be helped. Now at the time it happens, we may not, uh, you know, recognize it for what it is. And we might be at that low part in our lives and think God's abandoned us or is actually punishing us because we're not good enough people. And we might even break down and ask God why he's done that to us. Why have you done me wrong? Why have you put me in this position? But see, as we were talking about this morning, we got in that position because of the choices we made in life. God didn't put us there, but he's bringing us through them. Bringing us through them. God sends somebody to stand alongside of us to help us bring it through and become better in the process. Regifting. See, we must likely may not realize that God had done it at the time, but as it's promised in his word, God does not spare us the trials in our life, but he will bring us through them as a learning experience for us. 
And this has sets us up to be able to help somebody struggling with a similar uh, issue in the future. See, and the neat thing is, you didn't even know it was happening at the time. But you were being set up to be a re-gifter later on in your life. And yes, there are those out there who will actually reject it at the time out of anger or frustration. But the gift remains for them to take. God doesn't take that gift away and say, well, you're, you're not using it, so I'm going to take it back. He gave you the gift. It's there for you to use when the time is right. When God changes your heart, you'll use those gifts and you'll use them to help others. These are unseen and sometimes unrecognized gifts. And I'd like you to consider some of those are more foundational gifts that you may not recognize or may not have considered that God has already given to us. By our mere existence, he's already given us some other gifts that you probably don't recognize. So I was reading an article as I was uh, researching for the message today. Jordan Albina has listed five gifts from God that are unique to us as humans, as humans, and I'm going to share parts of those in my message today. So to do that, let's go all the way back to the beginning, okay? God created us. We were created in God's image to serve and worship God. That is our purpose in life. You ever hear anybody say, you know, what's my life for? You know, what, what am I here for? What's going on? Your purpose, we were created in God's image to serve and worship God. That's why we're here. And what goes along hand in hand with that are five unique gifts from God that play a role in our specific design to worship. So I want you to consider those today too. So I'm, I'm having you retain a lot of things. Now, you know, if possible, there's some clipboards over there, some sermon notes over there. If you ever want to take notes, you know, feel free because some of this is some of it's pretty good stuff, I heard. So okay, number one is the gift of wonder. The gift of wonder. See, unlike any other creature on the planet that has been created, God has given us the ability to observe, to recognize, and to understand who he is in creation. So, no other living creature that God has created has those innate abilities. And the ability to observe, recognize, and understand who God is in creation. So in Revelation 4, it tells us, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the all-powerful God who was and is and is, now most of you guys are probably mouthing the words, mm -hmm. and is to come. But it's coming. I like that better. I, I like that verb in this process. Is coming. It's an action, meaning he's on his way. Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. You created all things, and by your decision, they are and were created. See, we usually cuts off on verse 10 there, you know, and you say, Holy, holy is the Lord, the all-powerful God, who was and was and is, is coming. But our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive the glory and honor and power you created all things, and by your decision, they are and were created. When we look back at the teachings of the Truth Project that we went through earlier uh, last year, and we clearly see that those things are proven true. We, we proved who God was in the creation and through the creation, and how we were created to be and who we were created to be. And the more we come to see and know God, the more it leads us to realize how really big God is. How really big God is. So let me explain that. See, humans have the unique ability to wonder, not wander. Some of us do that, and especially as we get older, we tend to wander. Especially if you're going to the grocery store with my wife, and you turn around for a moment, and... <laughs> 
I swear her name is Copperfield because she's there one moment and gone the next, and then you wander the entire store trying to find her again. That happened yesterday. <clears throat> so we have the unique ability to wonder. Wonder. You read the message wrong. So I want you to think about it. When you were a kid, and maybe you were like me, and I went down and I laid it down in the grass in the yard at the farm, and I looked up at the clouds, and I, you know, just kind of wondered about all that was around me, all of the different things. And I listened to all the sounds of the birds and the bugs and the animals, and I wondered about a lot of different things. So as a kid, you're just laying there in the summertime in the shade. We had some really big trees there. But you lay down on that grass and you just kind of take it all in and you wonder about it. Why don't we do that as adults? Why do we ever get away from that? Those are great times. Because I was, I was reading this, I could remember. I could hear the sights. You know, or I could hear the sounds and I could, I could remember all of the sights and everything that was going on. And we didn't have all the distractions that we have in our lives today. And it gives you the opportunity to let your mind go. And so as I was laying there, I just let my mind go to wonder and to ponder. Yes, and I know there's probably at least one in the room here today just going, okay, did he ever get his mind back? So... But I did find it, and uh, it gave me that opportunity to let my mind go and wonder and ponder. See, because God made us with the ability to question. We have the ability to question. We were made to be curious. We were made to think about how the world was created. But not only that, but how it all fits so neatly together. How everything works in harmony together and you're laying there in the grass and you're listening to the bugs and you're watching butterflies as they're going over to the grapevines and over to the vegetables and in the huge garden we had back in those days and you could hear the cows over here and you could hear the chickens over here and how they all worked together that God created all these things that work together for us we were uniquely created to have a mind that can wonder and can ponder and can question. And it fits so neatly together, working in harmony. It's truly amazing, right? We are wired to consider the past and how God has been at work from the very beginning. We are specifically formed to look for God in the present and to see God working alongside us every day. We call those things God instances. And God instances happen if we take the time to open our eyes and more importantly, open our minds and our hearts to understand these things come from God. These are gifts from God we get every day. Blessings. God instances. And further, we're called to believe and hope for God to come in the future. Worship is our response to all these things. And it takes a life of wonder and imagination to worship the creator of the universe, though we physically cannot see him. Though we physically cannot see him. The evidence of God and the world he created is all around us. And here's the best part. Of that whole thing is we are the only creatures on the planet equipped for such a task to be able to see and to understand that this is God's creation and we are part of it we are integral in his creation and the world that he created when we look at a beautiful landscape and we see that dawning of a new day when we see the setting of the day in the sky or when we hold a newborn baby and we stand at the grave of a family member or even taste delicious food, biscuits and gravy, doesn't it lead you to wonder who God is? 
See, we bear witness to his creation each day. We can and we can't help in the process but worship and wonder about what an awesome God we have. God made us like this. He made us to seek him. He made us to wonder and to search for him. Our hearts and minds are transformed when we awaken to God, when we discover how awesome our God is, when we understand we were created by God for this very thing. We were created to worship God. He created this awesome world for us to live in, filled it with all kinds of wondrous things for us to wonder and ponder about and understand that all of this was created by God for us, given to us freely and openly as a gift. No strings attached. You're my child, you get it all. You inherited the whole thing the day you were born. Don't have to wait for him to die. Don't have to wait for anything like that. Don't got to worry about taxes. We inherit God's creation from the day we were born. Awesome, isn't it? We have an awesome God. Number two. God gave us the gift of a voice. Simply put, God decided that we alone should be able to communicate through verbal language. Paul says in Ephesians 5 that we should be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and in spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So imagine that for a second. Greeting each other in songs about Jesus. Now we got something to look forward to. See, that's what we're going to be able to do. Okay, I'll admit some of us are better singers than others, but it doesn't make a difference to God. God cares about what is in your heart, and that is what he's hearing from your mouth. See, worship, we're making a beautiful noise to the Lord. Worship is a beautiful sound to God. He doesn't care if we're on key or pitch or anything like that. Don't tell the vocal teachers or all the guys that I played in bands with. But it really doesn't matter to God because it's what's coming from your heart pouring from our mouths. That's what worship is. That's what counts. So, God cares about what's in your heart and that is what he hears from your mouth. Take that one home with you. Now this might make you uncomfortable thinking about it, but the reality is we are the only part of creation created uniquely and made to be able to accomplish this. We're the only ones out here that speak a verbal language. We're the only ones who can, can sing a verbal song. Birds sing a song, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Think about it. It isn't specific about the language because there's over 7,000 languages in the world today. It's not the name of the song. God's not playing name that tune up there. It's not the name of the song. It's not the type of song that's going on. It's not even about the details on how to accomplish that greeting that we're giving to God. But it's the act of worship. And it's just assumed as a Christian, as a follower of God, you'd want to be part of something like this. You've been given a voice that was made to allow you to give praises to the Lord all around the world. In every moment of the day, someone is crying out to God in worship. Our voices were made for worship. You think about that. 7,000 different languages crying out to God. 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. God gets to hear worship. He created us uniquely with a voice. A gift of a voice. And see, to follow up with that, God gave us the gift of a promise. And something overlooked is that worship is a rewarding experience. Now, got a question for you. You ever leave church and just say, oh, yeah, that's what I needed. 
you're at peace, joy, calm. See, that's what worship does. That's what we get from actively worshiping God. We get that calm and peace. And I'm hoping that at least one person here said yes. <clears throat> Whether it's by giving our life to Jesus or singing to him or attending worship, either in church or at an event, it's a blessing. So why is that? Not everything we do feels that way. Not everything we do fills us with joy. Not everything we do is worship. But when we worship, we get that joy. We get that calm. We get that peace. We get fulfillment. Remember what the scripture says in there that God wants us to have a fulfilled life? This is what it's about. This is how we get our fulfillment is through worship. Another sign of our lives being purpose for worship are the promises God gives us through his word. Listen to the psalmist remind us of the soul of reality just in being in God's presence. Psalm 1611. You make known the path of life. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is a fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611. So when we think about that, when we think about when we come to God in worship, we are entering into his presence. And when we do, he, he makes known to us that path of life, that path to eternal life. And being in his presence, we feel fulfilled. We feel peace, calm, joy. Awesome, isn't it? And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. A promise that God has for us and us alone is that when he made us, he made it so whenever we enter into his presence, we will experience supernatural joy. See, a lot of us know joy from our surroundings, from our circumstances, from things that are happening to us at the time. And those are just natural or created joys. But this is a supernatural joy that comes from God. That comes from our soul and wells out from within us. It's a different type of joy. Makes me think of the Garden of Eden. Because uh, wasn't that really the ultimate that God did? If you remember my message from last spring, I talked about how the Garden of Eden was in all aspects perfect. In every way, there was no sickness and no death, no hunger, no wars, no intolerance. There was total innocence, literally heaven on earth. In God's presence, we will be coming back into paradise. We will be coming back into Eden again. And then there, there is fullness of joy, unending joy eternal love. God made it so when we worship and seek him, his presence comes and makes known the path of life, gives us joy and blessings upon blessings, gifts upon gifts. It's not something we have to hope for. It's a promise to those who are made to receive it. God promised he is and will give us those things. And we know that when we stand upon God's word and we stand upon the spirit of God and we invite the Holy Spirit into us, those things live within us through his spirit. It's not something we have to hope for. It's something we receive. It's a promise. See, and along with that, God gives us the gift of a soul. And it's without question that that's the greatest part about being human. Is like, un unlike any other creature created here on earth, we have been given a soul and a spirit. In Genesis, God literally breathes life into man. In Ezekiel, it wasn't until the breath had entered that they had life. We are not just finite bodies, but we are keepers of an eternal soul, one that lives on 
after this life. Because of this, we aren't able to survive off of only temporal things. Man does not live by bread alone, but on the very word of God. He's telling us that life isn't dependent upon the temporal things, food and water. It keeps the physical body alive. But the soul, the soul feeds on God's word. Because that is what keeps us in touch with God. That's what keeps the spirit of God alive within us. Jesus said to the devil that man cannot live on bread alone, but needs the word of God. And that's because the word of God feeds our soul and our spirit. Our spirit is what connects us with Jesus when we worship. It is in the place that is filled when we open our mouth and open our lives to Jesus. When we say, yes, Lord, I invite you into my life. I want you to be in my life. I want you to be the Lord of my life. And we are born again with Christ. We are given that spirit and it energizes our soul. It connects our soul directly to God. And it says in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and per proper worship. What he's saying by that is, is, most people don't understand. Do I have to go out and sacrifice myself? No. Living sacrifice. You are to give your heart, you are to give your soul over to God and allow God to live within you with the Holy Spirit. That is a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is our true and proper worship. That's what that means. While our bodies run on food and water and air and rest and other things, our souls are only nourished by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, Jesus points to worship not just as something to participate in, but as something that because of our unique design, we need for our souls to survive. In order for our souls to live on, we have to have the Spirit of God living within us. Worship allows that Holy Spirit then to fill the well of our soul. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, nourishes our soul. Number five, God gave us the gift of truth. Lastly, but no way the least in value is the truth that the Word of God actually declares that in God's plan for humanity, that we were made to worship. And it's always been in the Father's heart to create beings that will discover his goodness through wonder and ponder and question and curiosity. And when we do that, we see his goodness and we see his goodness proclaimed through his works. And we respond in worship. Our gift back to God. We're re-gifting what God has given us in worship. Jesus came only to forgive us of our sins. Not only to forgive us of our sins, but to reveal us our true nature as human beings. Beings created for the physical and spiritual world. Designed for devotion and wired for worship. All over scripture, the Spirit of God reveals that our true nature is one of worship. It says, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That's our call to worship today. It's our call to worship that came from God. From his word, he is speaking it to us to say, hey, wake up. The hour is coming, but now it's here. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
Now's the time. This is the place. Declares the Lord in his word. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He created us to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So what does that tell you right off the bat? It says, hey, you can do all the good works you want to. You can come in here and you can warm a pew or warm a chair every week of the, of the year. And guess what? It's not going to get you to heaven. You ain't going to get there. But it says in here, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We have to speak the word of God in truth. We have to re-gift that word of God to others that have never heard that word. You may be the only face of Jesus that they ever see. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, Psalm 95, 6. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for the, his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. God created us to proclaim his word, to re-gift those gifts that he has given us. His word is a gift to us. Our lives are spelled out in that book. His life is spelled out in that book. Our future is spelled out in that book. The word of God made it clear, although we come into this world know nothing about who we are and what our purpose is, in the midst of that, Jesus came to open our eyes to the reality that God, the Father, made us to be in communion with him. To bring us back into that right relationship by his death on the cross. Jesus built the bridge back to God and reconnected our separation. And upon realizing this truth, the response from us has got to be worship has got to be worshipped. It's the natural response to those who understand what the Father's heart is for them. And that he made us not just to live a simple short life on earth, but to spend an eternity with him. And because we were created uniquely and gifted by God to re-gift those gifts and traits he gives us through the Holy Spirit, and that we alone can deliver the word of God to the rest of the world. He gave us that ability to have speech. How could we not take the time to wonder, to lift our voice, to take God up on his promises? See, you and I were made for this. We were made to worship. Are you ready to re-gift? Let us pray. Dear Lord, help us to do our very best each and every day to affirm one another, to remove the barriers that seem to hinder our relationships and keep us at a distance from one another. Please give us your grace to heal our short tempers, our destructive habits, and help us to let go of the grudges we hold on to so tightly. Inspire us, dear God, to be re-gifters of your grace your mercy, your blessings, and your love. Lord, lead us to be vessels and ambassadors of your forgiveness, of your healing love, and of your wisdom. Loving and gracious God, pour out your spirit upon us so that we will have the courage to reach out to those who have offended us or hurt us. And with your inspiration, Heavenly Father, May our efforts to heal wounds that hurt our families, that hurt our church, hurt our world, Lord, lead our hearts to worship you more fully each and every day, to come into communion with one another, to lift our voices, our unique gifts up to you, so that we might worship you more fully. 
Bless us, dear God, that we may have hearts full of your peace. May we strive to be reconciled to you and to one another. Help us to always to remember to live by the words that Jesus shared with his disciples when he taught them to pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I know you. I know you mentioned a joyful noise, <laughs> just a joyful clunk. Um, but I'm not going to sing. But throughout your message, I kept hearing Chris Tomlin's song "Made to Worship." You and I were made to worship. You and I are called to love. You and I are forgiven and free. You and I embrace, surrender. You and I choose to believe. Then you and I. We'll see who we were meant to be. There's another uh, song similar to that by Planet Shakers. Um, and there's just so many songs that call into the message today that emphasize, and I know you've picked some great songs for here shortly. So, um, But it's, that's God's amazing. Uh, he just brings it to us and he f allows us to see worship in so many ways. This is a time of worship as we come together each Sunday and share in this meal together. This is the way that Matthew records this in chapter 26, starting at verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it into pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my body, which confirms the covenant between God and his people, it is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In worship, we're called to action. But we're given this promise that we will see Jesus. We will have this meal with him. It gives us hope. Blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Fathers, we share in this meal each week. We give thanks to you. We thank you that through it, you give us that hope. Through it, we are able to worship you in just one way that we worship. Father, let us take the truths that we heard today. Let us go out into the world and use them. Don't let them be something that we just put on our, the proverbial shelf in our brain and let it collect dust. Let us be action-oriented with it, Father. Father, the, our country and our world are ripe right now for a harvest. Father, call all your people into repentance. Bring them into your churches and let them hear the word, your word, Father God. In Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Time for prayers for the people. Denise, I left you a post-it right there. Oh. 
Elizabeth and Jay Ransom. Oh, okay. So prayers for Dick and Jan Ransom and their family. Jan's brother Steve Vasatka passed away this past Tuesday. Okay, we will add him to the list as well. Anyone else this morning? Okay, so on 1 John 5, 3, 5. This is the love for God. <clears throat> Excuse me. To obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John 5:11, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, Jesus. Father God, we come to you this morning. Some of us have heavy hearts mourning the loss of loved ones. Some of us are in severe pain that seems like will never end. Some of us are, are severely depressed because of life's trials. But for whatever reason, you still woke us up today. You give us life and breath every single day that we walk upon this earth. So let us rejoice and say, I am a child of God. I am blessed. I am loved by the one and only God who created the universe and gives us all these blessings according to your will. I will rejoice because he gave us, you gave us your son to die on the cross so that we can have eternal life. We thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross in our place. You died so that we may live, and we praise your holy, holy name. So this morning, we want to thank you and praise you, Lord, for a new life brought into the world, another grandson for Bill and Carla. His name is Hudson Levi, and we thank you, Jesus, for his life, and we pray that you bless the family and um, give them peace in their family, and just always walk with this child, Lord God, and all of their grandsons, Lord Jesus. And Father God, I pray for Dick Rand and Jan Ransom's family who is uh, grieving the loss of their brother, Steve. I lift up Kim and Atlas family for the loss of their good friend, Kim, who they lost to, to cancer this last week. We ask, Father God, that you surround them with love from family and friends, that this may comfort their hearts and minds as they face each new day. Please give them the peace that passes all understanding and joy to have had this person in their lives for this time that you have allowed. Help them to feel your presence each and every day, Lord Jesus. I lift up my boss, Chris, who fell and broke her arm above and below the elbow last week, who will have surgery, have surgery soon. I pray for Deborah, who fell last week and has her leg in an immobilizer, who may have to have knee surgery. I pray for Jen from work, who has, um, <clears throat> who actually quit because she's having so many tremors that she can't work anymore. So I just pray that you will be with them. I pray for Mark for healing for his lungs. I thank you, Jesus, that you have healed him this week. It's a blessing, so let us thank you and praise you for that blessing. I pray for Harold that you will walk with him, Lord God. Comfort him. Have the doctors um, get his meds fixed so that they will help him and not hinder him, Lord Jesus and just be with him and comfort him throughout these days. I just ask, Father God, that the blood of Jesus wash over all I have mentioned, that you will heal each one of these persons according to your will. Comfort them, heal them, and help them through these trials that they will find you and feel your presence walking with them every day, Lord Jesus. For you are God and there is no other. And we ask this in your precious and holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Denise. So as we bring our online portion of our service today to a close, uh, I'd like to close it with a reconciliation prayer um, to God today. So pray this along silently with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and power in your name. Thank you that you created us 
to worship you. Thank you that you hold the keys over death and that by your might, Jesus was raised from the grave, paving the way for us to have a new life with you. Thank you that you had a plan for us and that you made a way for us to join you in eternity. We confess our need for you today to refresh us and to make us new again. We ask that you would renew our hearts, our minds, and our lives for the days ahead. We pray for your redemption for us. Keep your words of truth planted firmly within us, living within us. Help us to keep focused on what is pure and right. And Lord, give us the power to be obedient to your word. Let us trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger than all of the noise that is going on in the world today. Remind us that we are safe with you and that your purposes and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you would be our defense and our guard, keeping our way clear, removing the obstacles that would keep us from you, covering all of the pitfalls in life. Lord, lead us on your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us, and over us to be a light unto the world. May we make a difference in this world for your glory, for your purposes. Set your way before us. And may all your plans for us succeed, that we might reflect your peace, your hope, your joy, and your love to a world that so desperately needs your presence and your healing. Thanks be to you, God, our Creator, for all of these indescribable gifts that you give us. Remind us to re-gift those gifts to others in need. To you be the honor and the glory this day and each day forevermore. In Jesus' name.